formal part as that, you know. Sometimes MPs get criticised this, I think, unfairly. Politics is a team sport. Um, and we, we don't have a parliament of 650 independents. We, you know, Graham and I have similar views, but not identical views, and we sat together for seven years under the Conservative and we kind of agree that we're a team and we'll come up with a collective position and we'll, we'll try and support that position. And occasionally you might, if there's an issue where either your constituency feels strongly or personal conscience takes you in a different direction, you might take a different view for the whip. But this question was so existential to quite a large number of MPs and, and was exceptional in that regard. So I think you, I was going to make this point about indicative votes. I think you're right, there was quite a battle within the government. Some ministers wanted the indicative votes to be free votes so that they could express their personal opinions on these questions. And others within the government felt that if that happened, that was essentially the end of collective responsibility and the government would no longer look like a functioning whole. But if you imagine for a moment that, that that had been allowed to happen, then I think certainly the customs union vote would have, there would have been a majority in Parliament for that. Mm -hmm. But the May government could not have delivered that as a policy because, you know, as we were struggling to hold sufficient numbers of leave supported Conservative MPs in the government as it was. If we shifted the policy to include support for a customs union of a traditional kind, then the government would have broken apart. Um, and, and so that's, I, I basically agree with Meg's conclusion that essentially, whilst the sort of, whilst the thrust of the right reforms and strengthening the voice of the backbencher, the power of select committees, those were all good things, what happened in Brexit is that Parliament effectively became almost the government in some ways, or at least the government was governing a coalition with Parliament. And it was partly because John took a view, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be even more polite, I think he took a view that if the majority of the House wanted something, it was his job as Speaker to give it to the majority of the House. To, the, to such an extreme that if you had something that said this motion is unamendable, but the majority wanted to amend it, he would reinterpret the rule to say that it could be amended. And at that point, life becomes very difficult. Parliament wasn't very good at being a government though, was it? No. No. Um, which brings me back to the central point about procedure. And I, I think underestimating the extent to which Parliament depends on procedure, the where you bump up against the things that you just can't change because that's convention and it's accepted and everybody knows that's the rule, is when you actually have to be a bit creative and a bit accommodating and maybe start to compromise. And if you can start just bending all the rules or breaking all the rules, it doesn't work. I was going to throw in as well, I think one of the things that made this passage even worse uh, was the constitutional abomination that was the Fixed Term yes. Parliament Act. Yes. So, you know, the normal kind of uh, things that would impact on members of Parliament as they're thinking their way through all these things didn't apply. Is the government going to fall? Can the government say, well, if you do this, then we'll treat it as a base of confidence, we're going to go to the country. You couldn't do any of those things, and it was a part of the torture that we went through, and it really was just um, uh, painful. I can't tell you how awful it was for um, members of parliament because you just could see no way through it uh, that would work at all. I, I was going to just mention a couple of uh, one of the other problems of course is the original withdrawal agreement as it came back from Brussels um, was obviously something which was not going to enjoy majority support in the House of Commons and uh, I, mean, I heard it briefed on the on the radio I think it was and obviously pretty well briefed it was very detailed stuff on the BBC I asked to go and see Theresa straight away and I just said you know if this is accurate and I think it probably is this will not get a majority in the House of Commons and then when she sent some advisors over to brief me on it in more detail and the more detail I went into the more obvious it was that it wasn't going to get a majority uh, in, in Parliament and then I was trying to persuade her not to go to the put it to Parliament for a vote which was very obviously going to be defeated very, very heavily. And the whole point of that, that delay before Christmas, uh, was the hope that there would be a serious effort to try to get something different uh, that might actually get majority support. But instead, we ended up putting that uh, to the Commons and having the worst defeat in parliamentary history, which was a, a, a remarkable thing. And I, I suppose I'd just add on the issue of sort of party, partly party unity, but also... Uh, the effort to try to make progress. This is where uh, my amendment uh, was a, an effort to be constructive, find a way uh, forward that most people could coalesce around. And it was the only positive measure for Brexit 
uh, that actually won a majority in that parliament. Uh, and I think the majority was about 28 from, from memory. Uh, but the idea, funny, isn't it, how these things continue to, to haunt you. Um, <laughs> the idea uh, that you could proceed uh, with the withdrawal agreement, as long as you took away the political declaration and had, quote, unquote, um, uh, alternative arrangements at the Irish border. And you know, that was what we wanted. Um, and Parliament voted for it, uh, but it wasn't actually then secured. Just, just one sentence to add on. I mean, I think this point about fixed term Parliament is so profound. So let me pose a what if to you, which is that if, if that legislation had not been there, the government at some point, not for the first vote, but at some point down the line, would have said this is a confidence mm -hmm. vote. Now, it's possible at that point the government would have fallen, because mm. it's possible that the party would have said we're not prepared to allow Theresa to lead us into another general election. I don't know how that would have played out. But one way or another, it would have forced a resolution in a way that we were unable to do with the, with the law as it was yeah. there. 